Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to read from Psalms 100, uh, verses 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast loves for e love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. You know, we're going through a lot of troubled times. But the one thing that we have that isn't affected by our circumstances, our emotions, is joy. Joy is what comes from God. And we have come into his presence this morning to praise him, to honor him. So let's make that joyful noise this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful for the hope that we have in you. We thank you, God, that you are a constant in our lives and we can always lean on you. We just pray, God, that you would bless this church, that you would keep us safe, that uh, you would watch over us during these difficult times. And God, uh, may we just always be willing to support each other and, and rely on you for all of our needs. We thank you, God, for loving us. We thank you for this country we live in. And we pray, God, uh, your blessing upon the service. And may your Holy Spirit speak through Don as he brings the message you've laid upon his heart today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Fort Caroline Christian Church. What a perfect uh, scripture. So we're going to stand and make a joyful noise. We wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong Defender of the weak, 
Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me with a stranger, wandering from the To rescue me from danger, interpose his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Grace, Lord, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to Thee. Road to wander, Lord, I feel it. Road to leave the God I love. Pierce my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for Thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Thank you. You may be seated. They wept, the morning sun was dead, the Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him. i 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you on bended knee, as humble as we know how, thanking you for allowing us to get here together to worship and glorify you. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will do. We forever lift your name on high, forevermore. We pray this in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. At this communion table, we come face to face with the eternal Christ. In Revelations 1, verse 4, it says, Who is, who was, and who is to come. The writer of Hebrews speaks of him in chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. At this table, we see the Christ of yesterday. He is suffering in agony on a cruel Roman cross. And because he loved us so much, his body is cut and bleeding. At this table, we see the Christ of today, he is the living Christ who is right here in our midst, whose body and blood can be seen in these communion emblems and who is waiting for us to take him into our lives. At this table, we see the Christ of tomorrow. He is the Christ of the second coming who will appear at the climax of history when all of the peoples of the world will stand before him in judgment. We must remember as we eat this bread and drink from this cup of juice that these are but symbols of the living, eternal Christ, the Christ of yesterday, today, and forever. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for your faithfulness. God, we've come here this morning because we want to sing praises to your name and to honor you and to bring the glory that you deserve. Father, we just thank you for loving us. We thank you for all that you've provided for us. And we trust in you, God, during these very difficult times that you will care for us and that you will bless our lives. Thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together and partake of these emblems, God, to remember what you mean to us and what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stay. 
I guess these times have forced us to make changes, and of course that's made us to make changes in the way we take offering. But we do want to uh, thank you for your faithfulness and just um, remember all of those that have given uh, gifts towards the uh, purpose of the church. So let's pray. God, we are just so thankful for all of those who have been faithful um, and continue to give and God, we just ask that you bless these gifts and bless the giver. We pray, God, that um, these funds would be used to continue the work of the church in our community, uh, in our state, our nation, and across um, the world. We just want to also remember those missionaries uh, who are near and who are far and who are an extension of this church, and they are being faithful, just as all of the people here. God, may this church just be a light in our community, and may each of us be a light to those that we come in contact, that they might see you in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. And for those of you who are joining us online, we want to give a special welcome and uh, to this series that we are in called Heroes of Faith. And by the way, if you are watching online, would you just put a hello in the comment bar or something? Just let us know that you're here. We want to know that you're part of our worship time together as well. So far, we've looked at the Bible stories of Abel and Noah, and Abraham, and Jacob, and Joseph, and just seeing their incredible stories of faith. All these stories of faith, they serve as examples to us. They are heroes of faith, but it doesn't mean that those heroes of faith no longer exist. Now, we do not seek to imitate these individuals because they were sinners, just like we are. But instead, we strive to imitate the faith that they had in God and how they lived out their faith in life's ups and downs. Well, today we're going to be looking at the story of Moses uh, from his birth until God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. In Hebrews chapter 11, 
He gives us a definition of faith. And, and I'm going to ask you to do something a little different this morning. Would you read it out loud with me? And we'll, we'll coordinate one, two, three. Um, because my goal is I, I would hope that by the time we finish this series, you've got this verse memorized by heart. So here we go. One, two, three. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You did a great job. Like I say, by the time we finish this series, I hope you have that verse just ingrained in your heart. Now, since you did such a good job on that verse, I'm going to ask you to do it one more time. This time, maybe just a little louder. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Let's read that together. One, two, three. Without faith... It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, having faith in God is vital to our walk with God. And having that faith makes us pleasing to God. We want to please God. We want to strive to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Without faith... It's impossible. It's impossible to be a disciple of Jesus. It's impossible to please God. We must believe that he not just exists like out there in the world, but he exists in our lives. It's real to us. He has a real presence in our lives, and he promises to bless those who earnestly seek him. So in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, we, we find a synopsis of faith for Moses, like the other characters, the synopsis was given uh, of their lives as well. But you know, interesting, Hebrews 11 does not tell us everything that God did through Moses. And Moses lived to be 120 years old. The author of the book of Hebrews only gives us a brief record of those first 80 years. Surprisingly, the things that we remember most about Moses, such as meeting God at the burning bush on Mount Sinai, or how God used Moses to bring about the ten plagues of Egypt, how he led the Israelites through Egypt, uh, out of Egypt, how he received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, or how he led the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years. Those things are not mentioned at all by the author of Hebrews in chapter 11. They're not things that he says, by faith Moses met God at the burning bush, and so forth. Some of the greatest things that God did through Moses took place after Moses was 80 years old. So don't think that just because you are reaching that age that you're finished and God can't use you anymore. Amen? I thought I could get an amen out of that. The author of Hebrews actually gives credit to Moses' parents for the foundation that he had in his life regarding faith. Let's read Hebrews chapter 11, and I won't ask you to read it with me, but Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, uh, this morning to, to see what the author of Hebrews tells us about Moses. Here's the word of the Lord. It says, By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because that they saw he was not an ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Moses' parents, Amram and Jochebed, we all have familiar names like that in our families, Amram and Jochebed, they had amazing faith in God. They and the rest of the Israelites were descendants 
of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And those descendants came to Egypt during the time of famine, a worldwide famine. And years later, Joseph became the second in command of Israel. As we talked about last week, he was able to be used by God to provide salvation, physical salvation for the Israelites. Well, they stayed in Egypt, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for over 400 years. And sometime after Joseph died, the Egyptians forced the Israelites into slavery. The king of Egypt, he's also known as the Pharaoh, and a Pharaoh is like a title like the president, saw that the Israelites were increasing in number, and that greatly caused him alarm. He was afraid of them. So he ordered that all male Israelite babies must be murdered. And that will put an end to a potential revolt. Failure to do this certainly meant that the family itself would be punished, probably murdered themselves. But Amram and Jochebed, Moses' parents, through faith they chose to disobey Pharaoh and keep baby Moses alive. They attempted to hide Moses, but after three months, you know, as the baby grows, the strength of the lungs increases, and he cries, and you're thinking maybe the neighbors are going to hear, and they're going to investigate, and they're going to see, it's a baby boy. Why was he not killed? And maybe you get reported to the Egyptian authorities. Well, here, uh, I don't know if Amram and Jochebed tried any of these ways to describe, to disguise baby Moses. But here are my top 10 ways that they could have used to hide baby Moses. So the first one here, could have dressed him up like a biker. Number nine, as part of the normal meal at lunchtime. Number eight, disguise him as Charlie Brown. Number seven, as Fu Manchu. Number six, When I saw this picture, I thought, this is my Aunt Margaret and Aunt Sarah. And no, Aunt Margaret is watching this morning, and I apologize. Number five, the other king. Number four, the Israelites were shepherds after all, so just dress them up as one of the sheep. Number three, I I think this is Damon 20 years from now. Number two, this is either me or Captain Kangaroo. And the number one way to hide baby Moses is just simply to disguise him as Pharaoh himself. Now, all kidding aside, after three months, Amram and Jochebed chose the best way to hide baby Moses. They chose the best way. They entrusted Moses into God's care. They made a basket out of papyrus reeds, a reed that grows along the Nile River, to serve as a floating crib. They covered the outside of the basket with a pitch or tar that made it waterproof. They set baby Moses in this basket and set it afloat on the Nile River. Moses' parents asked Miriam, Moses' older sister, watch and see what happens. Well, here's the first thing that we can take away from this story. Faith means not being afraid. Faith means not being afraid. Moses' parents were not afraid of the king's edict, of his mandate. They had faith in God. They had faith to do what was right, no matter what the king was saying. They had faith that God would save baby Moses. They would faithfully trust God instead of obeying the king. They were not afraid. Faith instead of fear. It makes me wonder... What are my greatest fears? What are your greatest fears? Are you afraid of being alone? Afraid of financial hardships? Afraid of disease? Afraid of ridicule for sharing your faith? Afraid of dying? These are all real fears. But faith means You're not afraid of these things. You're not afraid of anyone or anything because we know who holds the future and we know who holds our hand. Faith means not being afraid because we trust God completely 
with our life and with the life of the family, just like Moses' parents. Egyptian records show that Pharaoh at this time was named Thutmosis I. And I'm glad that you're not historians in Egyptology and you can't correct me the way I pronounce this, but Thutmosis I was, according to Egyptian records, the Pharaoh at this time. And his queen's name was Amos. And she bore Pharaoh four children, but only the daughter survived. The daughter's name is Hatshepsut. I'm going to call her Hattie because I can't really say that word. It was Hattie who found baby Moses and took, her, and took him in to be her adopted son. Now Miriam, Moses' sister, saw that Hattie found the baby and took him and was not ready to drown him or feed him to the crocodiles, but ready to adopt him. So Miriam asked the princess, Do you, would you like me to find you a, a wet nurse to care for this baby? And Hattie, the, the Pharaoh's daughter, agreed to the idea. And Miriam just simply ran home and said, Mom, you'll never believe what? God did provide. God did save baby Moses. And the princess has them, and she wants to employ you as a wet nurse. And so God indeed did reward Moses' parents who earnestly sought him, knowing that he exists, and he exists right there in Egypt among the slavery. Now, without a doubt, Moses grew into a child, and without a doubt, Moses' mother told him about his true identity probably taught him some Hebrew songs, Hebrew alphabet, taught him about the God of his ancestors, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And we don't know how long Moses' real mother cared for him. Perhaps it was just during the years when he was breastfeeding, and as soon as he was weaned, he, he was turned over. But perhaps longer, perhaps it could have been for much of his early life that she was like a nanny. Obviously, it was long enough for her to instill faith into Moses. Now, Moses was raised as a prince of Egypt with the finest of education, housing, clothing, etc. He lacked for nothing. As part of the family of Pharaoh, Moses had the world at his fingertips. There's archaeological evidence that suggests that there was a possibility Moses could have been the first in line to be the next Pharaoh. I mean, after all, the current Pharaoh had four children. Three of them had died, and the only one remaining was a girl. And she was not going to serve as Pharaoh. So this adopted child, the grandson, baby Moses, could have been the first in line. However, Princess Hattie's father the current Pharaoh, Thutmosis I, he took another wife. And her name was Iset, who bore him, you guessed it, a son. And they named this child Thutmosis II. Really clever, creative naming there. Well, when the current Pharaoh died, the, the young child, Thutmosis II, was named the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. In keeping with Egyptian royalty, he must marry within the family. So Thutmosis II married his older stepsister, Hattie, who had adopted Moses. Since Thutmosis II was still quite young to become a pharaoh, well, his sister slash his wife stepped in to serve as co-pharaoh her husband, stepbrother, Thutmose II. I hope I haven't confused you with all these names. I'm trying to let you see the, the type of, of society that Moses was growing up in. Now, it could be assumed that Moses and the current, now younger stepbrother, uh, had sibling rivalry, especially when mom, stepmom, was also co Pharaoh and was also the wife of the other stepson. It's just very confusing. However, around the age of 40, Moses decides, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I don't want to have anything to do with the palace or being called the son of Pharaoh. I want to instead choose 
to be known as an Israelite. He chose his own people over the Egyptians. Moses refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin as a prince of Egypt. That's what the author of Hebrews says. He chose to be mistreated rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. He looked ahead to the eternal rewards from God rather than the temporary rewards of this world. Here's point number two. Faith means Christ is of more value than anything the world has to offer. By faith, Moses believed in things yet to come. He couldn't see them, but he believed that God would reward his faith. He trusted in an invisible God who promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob someday there will be a Savior called the Christ. Now, he didn't know his name was Jesus. That is, Moses didn't know the name would be Jesus, but he believed the promise of the coming Christ. For Moses, Christ was of more value in the world than anything that Egypt offered. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for me will find it. And this last verse, this is the point here. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what could a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you and I possibly choose that is of more value than Jesus Christ? Is there any amount of money that someone could offer you and convince you to deny Jesus as Lord and Savior? Is there any career that you would dream to have that would keep you away from your faith in Christ? Is there anything, anything at all of more greater value than our Savior, Jesus Christ? Well, Moses' faith in God and in this promise of the Christ, the Messiah that would come, was of more value to him than all the treasures of Egypt. By faith, Moses just left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. It says that he persevered. He persevered as a shepherd in Midian. For the next 40 years of his life, because the author of Hebrews says, he saw him, referring to God. He saw God who is invisible. Now, he didn't physically see God, but spiritually he could see God, and that allowed him to persevere. That's point number three. Faith means persevering because you can see the invisible God. Moses didn't look back. He didn't regret his decision to leave the palace, the extremely comfortable lifestyle. Instead, he now lived in a tent, was a shepherd. Moses persevered through a more tedious, dangerous, ho-hum life of shepherding. He was a leader of animals instead of a leader of a world superpower. He per persevered in, well, a less than awesome life because his faith allowed him to see an invisible God. Maybe your life didn't turn out the way you dreamed of. Maybe looking back, you remember the childhood dreams you had, I'm going to do this, I'm going to accomplish that. Maybe life didn't turn out quite that way. Maybe you never got to go on that special vacation that you always dreamed of. Maybe you didn't get the ideal career or live in the perfect home that you always wanted. But our faith allows us to persevere in less than ideal situations because we know it's all temporary. It's all going to pass. It's just temporary. Our faith allows us to see with spiritual eyes the reward that awaits us in heaven one day when Jesus is there and we see him face to face, the invisible God is no longer invisible. 
we see him. And he says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful to me. You followed me. You took up your cross, denied yourself, and followed me. You did not forfeit your soul for anything in the world. The last aspect of Moses' life that we're told about in the book of Hebrews here speaks of his return to Egypt when he's 80 years old. At 80 years old, God is going to send him on a mission that will last for the next 40 years. He's going to use him in a powerful way during the ten plagues to wreak havoc on Egypt and the forces that Pharaoh has to free the Israelites from slavery. The last plague is going to be the death of the firstborn child. The Israelites had seen firsthand the power of God through all these plagues. They've witnessed the destruction upon Egypt time after time, plague after plague. But this last plague, it will be different. It will be the worst yet. This plague is going to affect everyone. Egyptians, Israelites alike, everyone. It will cause the death of the firstborn child throughout the land. But God reveals to Moses, here's a little secret. This is what you can do to avoid that death angel from coming to your house and killing the firstborn child. And the secret is, take a lamb, kill it, collect the blood, and paint the blood on the doorframe of your house. If you do this, the angel of death will pass over your house. And thus the term, pass over. Doesn't that sound like a crazy plan? I mean, can you imagine that first time? We're familiar with the story. Can you imagine the first time God reveals this to Moses and Moses says, did I hear you right? You, You want us to take blood of a lamb and paint it on our house? And then Moses goes to tell the elders of Israel, This is what God wants us to do. And they're like, "Uh, wait a minute. Did you just say we're to paint blood on our houses? Yeah. It's a crazy plan. But that is what will save us. Moses' faith is, is severely tested. All of the Israelites are depending on Moses to get this right. What if Moses is wrong? What if the blood painted on the door frames of the house doesn't do any good? Moses didn't waver in his faith. Moses is confident in what God told him. Moses understands that lives are at stake and only faithful obedience to God will save them. And so Moses led the Israelites to do exactly that. They had faith that enabled them to put the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of the houses. And that night, the, the angel of death passed over the Israelite houses, because of the blood. Here's the last point, point number four. Faith means being obedient. Obedient unto salvation. It may seem silly to do what God says to do. It may not make sense, but obedience will save us. The Israelites followed Moses' instruction and his example By faith, they trusted God. They were saved from death by the blood of the Lamb that evening. On that first Passover night, the death angel killed the firstborn in all the Egyptian houses, but not in the homes of the Israelites who had painted their house, the doorframe of their house, with the blood. By faith, Moses and the Israelites obeyed God, and they were saved. Now, it doesn't take a Bible scholar to see the correlation here. You don't need a degree to see the correlation of this story. The correlation, that is, between the blood of a Passover lamb and the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, His blood saves us. It would not be sufficient if they just kind of halfway did things, the Israelites. They said, okay, I know we're supposed to kill the lamb and his blood be used to save us, so we're just going to kill the lamb and let the blood, you know, lay on the ground there. 
that's halfway. That wouldn't have worked. God is very clear. We must apply the blood to the doorframe of the house. In the same way, we must apply Jesus' blood to our life. It's not enough to say, well, Jesus died for my sins, and therefore I'm good. I can do whatever I want. No. You must apply the blood of Jesus to your life. Now, obviously, we don't have a blood uh, of Jesus somewhere around here in a, in a basin that we put on a forehead or something. So what's this talking about? Well, God's very clear. We all need forgiveness because we're all sinners. And God has provided that forgiveness through His Son, Jesus, who died on the cross and His blood was shed there. It takes faith to accept that His death can forgive our sins, make us holy. It takes faith to admit that to God that we actually need forgiveness. I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. It takes faith to do what God says and to be baptized into Christ. And we may think, well, that, that's just water doesn't really do anything. And so we just kind of stop short. It wouldn't have been sufficient if the lamb had just been killed without applying the blood. In the same way, when we're baptized into Christ, the Bible says that we are united with Christ. We are buried with him, and we rise like he rose from the grave. It takes faith to do that. It takes faith to make Jesus both your Savior and your Lord. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because God rewards those who earnestly seek Him. The question is, have you and I been obedient to follow God's instructions for salvation? Have you applied Jesus' blood to your sins? This morning, I hope you haven't just heard these words as if they came from me. But I hope you have heard this, these words of, from God's Word, that these came from God and have faith like Moses. Faith means we're not afraid of anything this world may throw at us because we're looking to, to God. Faith values Christ over anything the world has to offer. Faith makes us persevere in life's ups and downs Faith is definitely obedient unto salvation. So this morning, if God is speaking to you, He's calling you to step out. Step out in faith. Do something different. Follow Him in faith. The question is, will we answer that call this morning? Will we make the changes necessary? We're going to sing an invitation song in a moment, and I encourage you to examine your life, your faith, and respond to God. And if you want to come forward and share that with me, we'll talk about the next step that you need to make. Will you come as we sing? But before we do, let's pray and let's sincerely seek God and that He would continue to talk to us in this morning. Father God, this morning we, we thank You so much for the, the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. It's been 2,000 years, but that blood is still as powerful today as it ever was to provide forgiveness, salvation. Father, we pray that we would be obedient to you. We would step out on faith, that we would not fear anything and persevere. We would see an invisible God active in our lives and speaking to our hearts even this morning, right now. Father, this morning, we want to be obedient, so give us that, that courage to step out and say, I, I want to be obedient, and I want to make the changes that I know I need to make. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand? Let's sing, Come, as God is calling and speaking to you. close to you never let me go I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your 
friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you couple of quick announcements. Um, with the coronaviruses increasing, several people have asked me, you know, is there any changes in what we're doing here as we gather together on Sunday mornings? And so I just want to repeat the, the things that we already know. Please social distance when you come. Um, please wear your mask when coming in and before you sit down and, and when we're going out, just to be safe around other people that we may pass. So just do that for their benefit. Wear your mask in, wear your mask out. Um, the elders and I, are, we're monitoring all the news, as I'm sure you are. And if we see that changes will be uh, needed to be made, then, then we will definitely let you know. There is uh, next Sunday a baby shower. I think you have received an email yesterday about that. There's a baby shower for Becca, used to be Mass. And she got married, Jason and Becca Mitchell. Uh, next Sunday in the Fellowship Hall at 12 p.m., lunch is going to be provided. But because lunch is being provided, would you please RSVP to Leanne King? And if you don't have her number in the directory, you can call the office and we'll give you that phone number. Um, and we want to welcome uh, baby Olivia, beautiful name, Olivia Marie Mitchell, with uh, blessings uh, from our church family, even before we get to meet her. Um, please, if you would, take your communion cups and just toss them in the trash can on your way out. And let's uh, social distance as we go out as well. Will you pray with me as we are dismissed? Father God, we love you so much. You are such an awesome Father. This would be one thing just to call you a God, the God. But you want to be known more personally as our Father. Loving, embracing, forgiving relationship that we have with you and, and all that made possible through your son Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior as we leave here this morning uh, Father we, we want to be your hands and feet we want to be your voice the world around us is so hurting and divided and scared and we want to be that source of peace and comfort and salvation so use us in a powerful way this week and give us one this week that one person that we meet and encounter, that you have put us in that position and, and knowing that you want us to share uh, our, our love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. My youngest daughter... Yeah, yeah, y'all can sit down. My youngest daughter and her fiancé, Patrick Cooney, have a really good friend. And uh, when they... They're going to be moving... Um, down to the Lake George area eventually here in about a year's time and this this really good friend lives down there and he's a young man he's a he's got a young wife he's got two kids and about a couple weeks ago they were he was out um, this was just really got to my heart and the Lord worked on me right there uh, he was out in the woods riding in a side-by-side -side, ATV with a couple other guys late at night probably raising cane and they lost control and he they hit a tree and he went through the windshield of the side by side and went head first into the tree he's been in the hospital now in a coma now for a couple weeks and the diagnosis is is that he's going to probably end up being a vegetable 
and he's got two small kids. And you know, I don't think, I don't know if there's any church or anybody that's praying for him. And I've never laid eyes on this guy. His name is Christopher Dean. And he's a really good guy. He's a hardworking guy. He loves his family. And this tragic thing has just turned their world upside down. And when Hannah was telling me about it, I had tears in my eyes to hear it. So up here in Jacksonville, there's going to be a body of Christ that's going to pray for this guy. Would y'all pray with me? His name is Christopher Dean, and he needs our prayers desperately. Let's pray. Father, from your throne, and we come to you, Lord, we come to you through the blood of Christ. In full faith that you from your throne could put your hand upon him and bring forth a miracle. This family is desperate. They're hurting. The children want their daddy. Lord, I pray that you put your hand on him and give that family a miracle and heal him in a mighty way. His name is Christopher Dean, Lord. And I don't know if there's anybody praying for him, but we're praying for him. We give you all honor and all the glory. But please, Lord, hear our prayer. Hear our request. And put your hand upon him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Sprinkle rises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our song delivered. Do not think you won't grow.